Thank you, Nicole. I almost didn't recognize that person that you were talking about. And, and thank you to the AAMD for the invitation to speak today. This is a little bit of a different talk than I usually give on this subject. And the reason is most of you know what IMRT is, you're familiar with radio surgery, you're familiar with stereotactic body radiotherapy most likely. So it kind of, as I was preparing this talk, it cut out about the first half hour of what I usually talk about. So we're gonna kind of jump forward a little bit here. And we're primarily going to focus on primary, primarily on hepatocellular carcinoma as opposed to metastatic disease in the liver, which SBRT is also indicated for in, in selected patients. We're going to emphasize the interplay of various treatment options in the liver and talk about the use of SBRT as a bridge to transplant, which is what we're primarily using it for in our clinic. We'll throw in some pictures of other things along the way. When we talk about the liver, we're usually talking about, in this context, a diseased liver. And quite often there is cirrhosis, some underlying dysfunction that, as we'll talk about, will contribute to the pathogenesis of the tumors that we're treating. When we talk about how well a patient is doing, we need a, a way to communicate whether they're very sick, whether they're a little bit sick, or whether they're just barely sick. And so the child pew classification that the internal medicine docs give to us is a convenient way to do that. It's a scoring system that's based on both the metabolic functions of the liver and also the synthetic functions that primarily have to do with clotting in the, the body. And you can end up with the scoring system with a class A, which is a pretty high functioning patient, all the way to a class C, which is a patient that is probably hanging, waiting for transplant, if they're eligible for that. When we talk about hepatocellular carcinoma, there is a radiographic diagnostic criteria. It's called the Barcelona criteria. And basically, if you have two separate, two different imaging modalities that show the characteristic or pathognomonic findings for HCC, and the lesion is bigger than two centimeters, so either MRI, angio, CT, ultrasound, angiography. If you have a lesion that's bigger than two centimeters, that's path pathognomonically imaged on two modalities, then you don't need to biopsy that tumor. Or you can have just one imaging study if you have an elevated alpha theta protein, which is elevated in a, a substantial number of these tumors. The importance of this is that the liver is very there's a very high blood flow. It's not the safest place to biopsy. And also, this particular type of tumor can seed along biopsy tracks. So you can end up with recurrences along the track in the liver or even out in the body wall where the, the needle had passed through. So if you can avoid biopsy, that's a good thing. When someone has a limited volume hepatocellular carcinoma, there are a number of treatment options. And Surgical resection is a possibility. Liver transplantation is a possibility. The injection locally of chemotherapy where we're going through the groin, the interventional radiologist will thread catheters right up to the tumor and inject chemotherapy. TACE is one way. Radiofrequency ablation, usually percutaneously, where a, a needle is placed through the body wall into the tumor and then with microwave heating, it's basically cooking the tumor. You can do injections of, of alcohol, you can do cryotherapy, you can do selective internal radiation therapy or CERT, which is basically what we would have called radionuclide injections, so things like yttrium. I guess they needed an SIRT if there was an SBRT. And you can do intensity modulated radiotherapy, the stereotactic body or radiotherapy, or you can treat with chemotherapy with serafinib. What this means is with this large number of, of options, large number of possibilities on our palate, that the treatment decisions really need to be made in a multidisciplinary way. So for the patients that we treat in our clinic, we have a liver tumor board that meets every two weeks. All of the surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, interventional radiologists, the people that treat these tumors sit down and, and have a collegial discussion about what would be most appropriate for any given patient. 
if we take some examples of why we would pick one treatment or another, if you look at primary resection, so not transplant, but just a partial resection of the liver, the surgeon's goal is to remove the visible tumor with about a 1 cm margin of normal tissue. And one of the reasons I've got this slide up here is we've taken a lot of the surgeon's goals and translated them into our SBRT goals in terms of the volume, what's safe for the liver. So if they have tumors that are less than about five centimeters, they can do what's called a non-anatomic wedge resection. That means just going in and taking the tumor out. And they do that for superficial, smaller lesions. For larger lesions or very deep lesions, it's safer and probably more effective to do an anatomic resection where they'll go in and actually take out one or two lobes of the liver, one or two segments of the liver, I should say. And with this approach, if you resect a small HCC, the five-year survival is pretty good, about 50 to 75 percent. The problem is that only about 15 percent of HCC tumors are amenable. Or usually it's the patient's medical condition that's a limitation or advanced presentation by the time these lesions are identified. Another goal that the surgeons have is they try and retain at least as a minimum 700 cc's of functional liver. Now remember, these are in patients who are surgical candidates, which translates into their livers working pretty well. Okay, so if you have a diseased liver, 700 cc's wouldn't be enough. If you look at the radiofrequency ablation, that is, there are contraindications to this approach. If you can't visualize the tumor by ultrasound, then you can't target it. Sometimes you can still do an open procedure where the surgeon actually opens the abdomen and they can go in with the ultrasound directly on the liver. But an example of a location where you can't use RFA very easily, that was the wrong one, there we go, it would be something like the hepatic dome because ultrasound isn't effective through air. So if you have to look through a portion of the lung, you're not going to be able to target those lesions. And RFA is effective with a, about an 80 to 90 percent local control long term for tumors up to about three centimeters in greatest dimension. Now the interventional radiologists will often go ahead and try and target or try and treat lesions that are up to five or six centimeters, but the effectiveness of that approach for the larger lesions falls off dramatically. It really isn't that, that recommended. Another example of a place where you wouldn't want to use RFA because you're putting a needle into the tumor is if you have exophytic lesions that are growing out of the liver, particularly in a setting of ascites where the entire abdomen's full of fluid. And the reason is, if you put a needle into that tumor and it starts bleeding, nothing will stop it. Now you're going to surgery to deal with that. Also, if tumors are abutting high flow vessels, the RFA isn't very effective because remember, you're heating these tumors to kill the cells. If the tumor is sitting right up next to a high flow vessel, that acts as a heat sink. It's carrying the heat away and you'll end up with a portion of the tumor that wasn't treated to an adequate dose, so recurrences would be very high. There also are some structures that are sensitive to the, the heating, so you don't use this technique if you're immediately up against the gallbladder or small bowel, kidney, or stomach. If you look at TACE, which is the other fairly common approach to treating these things, they do the catheterization through the groin, they do a test injection of contrast material, and if they can't visualize the lesion, if it doesn't show up on the angiogram, then they're not going to treat with, with that approach. Also, there's a limitation with liver function, and the interventional radiologists key almost exclusively on the total bilirubin. And if that's elevated to a level, depending on who the radiologist is, to about 2.5 or 4, with probably around 3 being the most common value, they won't attempt this kind of procedure because of concerns of the risk. Also, the reason that TACE works, because it's an embolic approach, the reason it works is because the hepatocellular carcinomas primarily derive their blood supply from the, arter the arteries, the arterial supply, while the liver parenchyma, the functional part of the liver, is primarily fed by the venous side. So that's why you can embolize the arterial side at the tumor without damaging too much of the liver. However, if you have a portal vein thrombosis, so the 
venous side is not flowing very well, that becomes a, a risk. And it also becomes a contraindication to taste because the, the liver isn't going to be able to support itself. It's probably starting to feed off the arterial side. There are some other things. If you have an uncorrectable, uncorrectable coagulopathy, they tend not to do this. This is kind of an interesting one. If they're injecting primarily adriamycin, that's probably the most common chemotherapeutic agent. And we know from treating other tumors at other locations in the body that there's a limitation on how much adriamycin you can give because the heart won't tolerate excessive doses over time. So when I first was looking at treating livers and talking with the interventional radiologist, they were telling me about how many times they could treat with TACE and then they'd have to stop because they'd reached that limit. I asked what I thought was a really trivial question and that's if you're giving adriamycin peripherally in the arm, most commonly, or through a, a port, that goes into the systemic circulation and exposes the whole body. However, it's typically broken down in the liver. So if you're giving the anthracycline directly into the liver, then your first pass effect, breaking it down, is going to mean that what goes into the systemic rest of the body that the heart is going to see is going to be very low. And, and subsequently, there have been publications showing that you can do this indefinitely because you're not really exposing the heart to much of the adriamycin. One thing with the taste, these patients tend to be very sick for a period of time after the treatment, for two or three days. They have significant abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, fever, and fatigue. So when we've had patients who've had treatment with a lesion for taste, treatment with a lesion for R using RFA, treatment using SBRT, if you ask them, well, which would you want to do again, SBRT is usually the hands down favorite. Sometimes they'll pick RFA because it's just a single session. In terms of, of chemotherapy, serafinib, which is kind of a, a dirty TKI or, or tyrosine kinase inhibitor, meaning that it affects a lot of pathways, not just one specifically, is used for patients with advanced disease. However, these are patients where advanced disease means they're not eligible for any of the other fairly common treatments. They're not eligible for transplant. However, they still have good functional status of the liver, child's pew class A. And when the study was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008, it was very exciting because it showed that it resulted in about a three-month survival advantage. Sounds very small, it is very small. It wasn't even three months, it was about three months. But you have to put that in the context of over 30 years up until this study, with over 100 published trials, none of them had shown an advantage, a survival advantage. So this really was a very new and exciting finding. The primary toxicity with this treatment is diarrhea and hand-foot syndrome. The cost is well above $5,000 per month. To put that in context, if you look at something like TACE, so when the interventional radiologist goes and injects chemotherapy, that usually runs about 13,000. If you look at SBRT, it usually runs about 11. So the interventional procedures are very comparable or very cost effective relative to giving a drug like this for an extended period of time. There also are good reasons to be looking at this, and a number of people are, as a radio sensitizer. So at the tumor board discussions, what we're looking at is whether resection for limited volume disease is medically reasonable. A caveat to that is we do have patients where it would make sense to go in a resect a lesion, but if that patient is on a transplant list, we don't. And the reason is that the surgeons don't want scarring, they don't want any of the vessels disrupted and things, so they don't want to go into the abdomen ahead of time for one procedure if they plan to do a transplant later. And that's, that's the second line here. We use RFA as probably the most common treatment for accessible and visualizable lesions that are less than or equal to about three centimeters. We consider combining therapy for lesions that are bigger than about three centimeters. So RFA plus TACE or TACE plus XRT. We consider serafinib for advanced disease, but only in the patients who have good liver function 
And we also, this is kind of an interesting use of radiation. We use radiation, we use IMRT to treat portal vein thrombus if the patients have very poor liver function on the basis of that obstruction. So if the blood flow is not good in the liver, the liver's not working well, it precludes a number of the other treatments, but we can go in and treat with radiation. We usually treat 30 gray, 10 fractions, treating the visualized thrombus with about a one centimeter margin. Open those vessels up, restore blood flow, get the liver working again, and then some of the other treatments can become possible. The bottom line, though, is without transplant for HCC, the five-year survival is less than 10% with all of these other local treatments if we don't actually go to transplant. With transplant, the five-year survival is greater than 70%, probably substantially greater than 70% in patients who are being transplanted now. So let's talk a little bit about the context for hepatocellular carcinoma. The, a very large number of the HCCs that we're seeing right now are related to hepatitis C virus. There was an epidemic of IV drug use that peaked back in the 60s. And if somebody is sharing needles, it's a very high probability of transmitting HCV. Remember that back in that period of time, we didn't know there was such a thing. So it was also transmitted in blood transfusions and this sort of thing because we didn't have a test. We didn't know there was a hepatitis C. It's rarely through sexual contact, although that's possible. It's really a blood-borne virus. This is kind of startling to me. About 3% of the world's population has been exposed and infected with hep C. And you can see the map over here that it's primarily in Africa and Asia. I think the rate for Ethiopia, no, for Egypt was the highest in the world at about 15% of the population. And there are about 4 million people in the United States that have hep C. It's asymptomatic for many years. It's a silent infection, so it's, it's easy for it to continue being transmitted. It's at the the, basically the county hospital here, University Hospital, they recently introduced a program where there is an opt-out screening program for hepatitis C when patients are admitted if they haven't been tested before. So any patient that comes into the hospital, they're testing for hep C unless the patient specifically says, I don't want to have that testing because it is a silent disease. About 80% of these patients will develop chronic cirrhosis over the years. And what's most significant is that about 15 to 20 percent will develop end stage liver disease typically about 25 years, 20 to 30 years after acquiring the virus. And that's why we're seeing this large number of tumors now. It's because of the high rate of exposures back in the 60s and into the 70s that are now translating into tumors. Because when these patients develop the end-stage liver disease, about 3 to 7 percent of them per year develop hepatocellular carcinoma, very high rates. And so a lot of these patients are now on the liver transplant list. Now, the reason that they're being transplanted, the reason that we aren't just treating these lesions, is what I like to call the popcorn theory. This is the way I describe this to patients. If someone has chronic inflammation, that's a permissive state for developing cancer anywhere in the body. That's one of the reasons that your dentist tells you to floss so that you get rid of that low-grade chronic inflammation. It reduces the risk of some cancers elsewhere in the body because of cytokines that are released by inflammation. So the patients with the end-stage liver disease at a high rate develop HCC. Transplant is the only curative treatment because if you think of the liver kind of like this pan full of popcorn being heated in oil, you may have a kernel or two that pop, and we can deal with those very effectively. We can probably take care of those with a, a 90 plus percent chance of local control. But you're still heating all the rest of those kernels, the rest of the liver, and so over time more tumors are going to develop. And it isn't a metastatic process. It isn't that we didn't take care of this and cells showed up somewhere. It's just that the whole liver is primed to develop these tumors. 
So the model for end-stage liver disease, the MELD score, is what's used on the transplant list to determine who gets a liver. And basically it takes some, some factors that aren't so important to our discussion, puts them into a formula, and generates a, a score. And depending on what that score is, the patient goes higher or lower on the transplant list. And so the scores, if it's less than 15, that person's got a sick liver, but it's probably too early for transplant because they could percolate along for a number of years yet. If they're in the 24 to 29 range, that's in stage, but they're not sick enough to require hospitalization. Somebody who is 30 or above is probably sitting in the hospital for an extended period hoping that they get a liver that matches. If someone develops hepatocellular carcinoma when they're on a transplant list, they get exception points that move them up the list. And about every six months, there's a reevaluation, and they get more exception points, which move them even further up the list. The reason for doing that is that we'll talk about in a moment, you can transplant patients with limited volume disease. But when the disease gets beyond a certain point, certain number of lesions, certain size of lesions, or it shows up elsewhere in the body, in the nodes, for instance, near the liver. Those patients come off the transplant list and they never go back on. And the reason for that is when there's a lot of disease, the risk of metastatic disease being present in the body is higher. And if you do a transplant and you use the immunosuppressive regimens that are necessary to maintain that and someone has metastatic disease, you're going to promote it and cause it to blossom very quickly. So it wouldn't be a good use. It wouldn't be any favor to the patient. It wouldn't be a good use of a very limited resource in the livers. The other thing that I'll mention is the exception points are requested if the HCC is greater than two centimeters in size. Transplant lists have a little bit of a gaming aspect to them. And so if we see a patient that has a lesion and they're on the transplant list and that lesion is 1.8 centimeters, we may actually re-image that patient in a couple of months, usually in preparation for treatment is the way we do it, because then we can get a measurement that it's grown a little bit, it's slightly over two centimeters to make sure they get those exception points. Because otherwise, we can treat that lesion they don't get the exception points, they don't move up the transplant list the way they did, and we, you know, we could end up causing somebody to get bumped off the transplant list later as a result of that. So criteria for liver transplantation, of course, originally, if a patient had HCC, they were not eligible for transplant. But in certain of the programs around the world, they started doing this in a limited way, showing good results, and now there are fairly well-established criteria. And so if you look at what's called the Milan criteria, they take solitary lesions that are up to five centimeters in size, or up to three lesions with none greater than three centimeters. And when they use those criteria for selecting patients to go ahead and take them to transplant, they have a four-year overall survival of 85% and a four-year disease-free survival of over 92% or at 92%, which is comparable to patients who've had liver transplants that didn't have a cancer. So that's very reassuring. And these criteria are gradually being liberalized. So now in Texas and Oklahoma, where the, the two programs are, are combined and, and treated as one region, They'll allow transplants for up to three lesions, none greater than six centimeters, and the sum of the three being up to nine centimeters. So that just opens up those criteria, makes them a little bit easier for someone to fit onto the transplant list. Just to talk with you a little bit about the, the techniques that we're using and techniques that other people are using. For mobilization, typically we use body molds or frames and we emphasize patient comfort rather than things like excessive compression. And people often have a misunderstanding of why the compression is used. The compression can be applied so tightly 
that it restricts the motion of the diaphragm. Patients tend not to tolerate that well, because remember, these treatments will take several minutes to deliver. But really, the compression is used to change the way the patient breathes. So by, if you watch someone breathe, if you just sit sometime when you're talking with someone and watch them breathe, what you'll see is they shift very fluidly between breathing with their diaphragm or breathing with their chest, more of a bellows effect. And if you put a little bit of compression on the abdomen like we're doing here, that shifts the patient into using that bellows type motion and the diaphragm stops moving as much up and down. Since the diaphragm is going to be driving the liver up and down, it just makes our job a lot easier that way. For our patients, we do let them have light meals before simulation and before each treatment. We just ask them not to come into San Antonio and go find their very favorite Mexican restaurant and pork out right before treatment. That doesn't work very well. If a patient has ascites, those patients can be very unstable in terms of their abdominal girth, which would, of course, affect what we're doing. So we work closely with their internist to try and keep them regulated at about the same weight through the course of treatment. For those patients, we tend to simulate and treat very quickly rather than taking a few days to plan because we don't want to allow time for things to change. And we also tend to favor schedules that are going to be done quicker, three-day schedules if we can, can do that instead of five or ten-day schedules. For those patients, we do measure the abdominal girth every day and we also weigh them as we're going through treatment to give us a clue if there's a change. Now there, there are other techniques. Here, here you can see the arrangements that, that we use, two different systems and also two, over the years two different machines. People also do these kinds of treatments and I've, I've done these treatments with a gating technique where you actually are turning the machine on and off based on fiducials. People do these with tracking techniques. That's one of the things we developed in, in Cleveland a number of years ago, where fiducials are planted and you actually track the motion. In Asia, people have done tracking by using basically a, a multi-leaf, very simple multi-leaf, and having a, a hole and a block basically that slides with the tumor. So the beam is on to a bigger field, but the multi-leaf is creating an aperture that can move to stay over the tumor during the motions. People also do breath hold techniques. I think that's the only one of the major techniques that I've not ever, ever used. And so those are all ways to do this kind of treatment. So the, the key elements, form-fitting molds, abdominal compression, we do our planning from an angio CT, and we do careful structure delineation because remember we're going to be applying large doses, and there's some exquisitely sensitive structures in the abdomen, the duodenum being the most sensitive, and often that's very close to what we're treating. We do thoughtful expansions. From the visualized tumor, a typical expansion that we would use would be about a half centimeter to seven millimeters maybe, but about a half centimeter within the liver itself. And then another half centimeter beyond that that can go outside of the liver if that's the direction it, it needs to go. And so that's giving us a margin that's similar to what the surgeons are trying to achieve if they went in and resected the tumor. And let's see, then with our treatments, we're typically doing a cone beam CT on the couch. I'll show you some pictures of that. We do the alignment shifts prior to the radiation, and then we're delivering ablative doses, which is, is very consistent among a number of facilities doing these treatments. This picture shows the alignment that we're doing on the table, and, and this is my favorite way to do SBRT. These are checkerboarded images, and one of the image sets is showing the angio CT from simulation, and the other is showing the cone beam CT on the treatment machine. And what you'll notice is we're not giving contrast every day for our treatments on the, on the treatment machine, but you notice we can see the liver in this case, or the tumor in this case on both sets. And that's because this patient had taste before SBRT, and they inject a substance called epidiol or, or lipiodol is another name for it, and that stays within the tumor for quite a few weeks, even a few months after treatment. 
and it lights up on our, our scans because of the difference in the, the density. And so that's kind of the ultimate fiducial because we can see the entire tumor in this case. We went through a period of time where we couldn't use this technique because the FDA got unhappy with the company that was bringing ethiodol into the country and they made them stop. And it now has become available again, so we're starting to use it again. So treatment schedules that we've been using, 45 gray and three fractions, typically delivered two times a week. If a patient comes in from a, a great distance, we will try and do this on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, just to make it more convenient for them. And if we have to do more treatments, if we can't reach the, the goals in terms of sensitive structures that are nearby, then we typically have been delivering 50 gray and 10 fractions, and that again is two to three times per week. Typically we're looking for about a 30% peaking dose within the tumor. If we're treating using IMRT, 30 gray and 10 for thrombus, if that's our indication, then we don't look for the peaking dose. That's a true IMRT, con more conventional IMRT treatment where we're looking for plus or minus 10% in the treatment volume. In terms of, of sensitivities, one of the, the most poorly characterized things about SBRT treatments in the liver is, and anywhere in the body at this point, is what are the sensitivities or the tolerances of the normal structures. There was the AAPM Task Group 101 that was published in August of 2010. And if you're doing SBRT, I'm sure you're familiar with this. What it does is it gives us structures and dose constraints for one fraction, three, and five fractions. And so you can take a particular structure, look at what the constraint is, and read across and see what the doses would be for the, the different structures. I will warn you, if you're using this, that there is at least one error I know about in this table. And so look at this carefully when you're using it. Don't just say, oh, it's published, there are the numbers. You still need to sit down and, and go over those and make sure that, that you believe what you're seeing. And I apologize that I don't remember because it's been a couple of years since we found it, so I don't remember which structure has the error. So that, that's an exercise that's left to the reader, I think is what they used to say in the, the physics textbooks. Or if anybody really wants to know when I get back to my office, you can, can call or email me. The anatomy of the liver is defined by the surgeons according to ligaments and major vessels. And so you'll read the literature, you'll hear people talking about the various segments. One of the most useful things that we can do in terms of helping to define the tolerance of adjacent structures and perhaps differences in tolerance in different part of the livers is to make sure when we're doing this kind of treatment that we do report what segments we're treating in. There, there are some segments that anatomically are very different. For instance, the caudate lobe in the liver, the blood supply is actually dual, much more so than, than other parts of the liver. It may be a different sensitivity in that area. There are atlases that I would encourage you to use. This one happens to be from Wayne State, and it helps to define the structures in if you sit down with physicians, or physicians who are doing SBRT sit down and compare what the plans are, because we do this occasionally. We ship you know, data sets around and everybody plans them and we compare what we, we've done. What really drives the results more than anything else is differences in contouring. And particularly the duodenum is a structure that if you're not used to contouring it, you're just gonna get it in the wrong place if you haven't really sat down and, and done this for a while. So using these atlases is a very good idea. And it can often determine the contouring, whether you're going to recommend IMRT for a patient or whether you're gonna be able to offer SBRT for them. So here's a patient. This is, is one who has a metastatic lesion and it was fairly large. And so to meet our constraints for the liver, we weren't able to do the three fraction treatment, we did the five fraction treatment. And when we did that, we had a good result with the tumor, 
but almost immediately afterwards the patient was given full Fox chemotherapy and ended up in the hospital with exquisite pain in the abdominal wall and a lot of tissue reaction. You can see it over here and you can see if you took the compression away that it actually fits pretty well with where the higher dose region was in the abdominal wall. So what this was, was basically an anthracycline given right after radiation with a very dramatic recall effect. And this patient was about to go to surgery because they were trying to figure out what was going on in these tissues. They thought maybe he had an abscess, that maybe it was an infection. So he was scheduled for surgery and happily his wife called and said, I just thought you'd like to know, you know what we're going through with this looked at the pictures, went over, said, well, let's stop the narcotics, let's start non-steroidals, and a day later, the guy was feeling fine because it was an inflammatory recall response from the radiation. What this points out, probably more than anything else, other than be careful about doses to the abdominal wall, particularly if there's gonna be systemic therapy, is that our colleagues in other specialties still aren't familiar with what SBRT means. So they're not used to seeing tissue reactions and interactions with drug therapies with these high doses in parts of the body where they're, they're not used to seeing them. So we, we have a lot of education to do in that area. The big nemesis for treating, we talked about where you can go look at these tables for, for tolerances. The fear that we have, kind of like spinal cord compression when we're treating there, is radiation-induced liver disease. And it's a form of veno-occlusive disease, and it has marked central occlusion of the, the vessels in the liver, so it stops the blood flow. And another term for it is radiation hepatitis. Not a very good term for it, but it is. And this develops weeks to months after radiation, and it's typically managed with supportive measures. What's important to know is there are risk factors for this, and if we know those risk factors are present, then that table from the Task Force 101 gets put out the window. And that's because those are for normal tissue tolerances to radiation, not tolerances in a sick liver, and that's another thing to be very aware of in planning these. So. One of the things that we'll talk about here in a moment is that hepatitis B can be reactivated by radiation. And so that's one of the things that you need to be aware of if you're seeing you know, disease hepatitis acutely in the patients is that could be what you are seeing. These are numbers that for whole liver tolerance, partial liver tolerance that come primarily from University of Michigan, from some of their early dose escalation studies that were using 3D formal treatments. And this is making the point of what I was just saying, that we have these tables that give us tolerances, but they're guidelines for normal structures. So if you're treating a patient with metastatic disease in the liver, they're probably very good numbers. And sparing 700 cc's of liver as a minimum may be a very good number because that liver is functioning very well, it just happens to have a tumor in it. If you're talking about patients with chronic cirrhosis and they've developed a hepatocellular carcinoma, it's a totally different animal. So the liver's not working well and you need to be much more, liver, much more liberal in terms of the amount of liver that you're sparing. And that's in a context of livers that are often cirrhosed and very small. It, it gets to be quite a tightrope sometimes. So this is a paper that I put on here because I think the reference is important. And it came out of Taiwan and it was looking at relative risk factors for the radiation-induced liver disease. And what it found was that if you have a child's Q group A liver, you can use pretty close, pretty much the tolerances that are published. But if you have a sicker liver, if you have a group B liver, there's a 3.6 times increase in the risk of radiation-induced disease. And if you have a patient who, instead of hep C, has a hepatitis B-induced cirrhosis, then it's almost 10 times 
the increased risk. And that's just shown here in these curves where if you look at the whole group that they examined and say, okay, what is the, the dose volume envelope that would be safe, if they have a pretty high functioning liver, you can push harder. If they have a sicker liver, you have to be more cautious. And similarly, if you look at patients who don't have hepatitis B, they do pretty well, but the numbers for the whole group are pulled down by the patients that have hepatitis B because they react so poorly. If we look at, at follow-up, this is another area that needs more definition, and that's basically after we do SBRT or some of these other treatments in the liver, we need to have a better way of understanding what we are seeing and whether we're getting a good response. So this is an example of a patient that was treated for 50 gram, five fractions. They had a pretreatment AFP of 1628, which is markedly elevated. One month after treatment, we really don't see much change in the, the liver, in the treatment, in the treated tumor. And also there was a new small lesion, so that's again this idea that new tumors keep popping up. By the time you get out four months, there's very marked decrease in the contrast uptake and the, the lesion that was treated is smaller in terms of just an, an imaging abnormality, but there are multiple new lesions and the AFP is starting to go up. It is natured very low in between these two. We typically, after treatment, are imaging about every three months and, and doing surveillance. And then each time we do a new set of images, we go back to the tumor board and we sit down again and say, okay, if there's a new lesion, how would we treat this one? So the type of treatment that a patient may have for a lesion at any given time doesn't predict what the next lesion should, what we would use for the next lesion, because it would depend on exactly where it was and how big. And this slide, I think I'm just going to go past. And this one. This is a patient who was, was treated with two lesions. And just like when we do radio surgery in the brain, if we have two lesions that are close together, we can start getting interaction between the, the distributions. That's a more pronounced effect in the liver, primarily because we're treating larger lesions and we have access to fewer directions to treat from. You know, in the brain, you've basically got a hemisphere and you can pick any direction that you want. When you're treating in the center of the body, you're much more constrained in terms of your out-of-plane fields that you can achieve. The other thing is just like radio surgery in the brain, the bigger the lesion is, the shallower the gradient's going to be because the beams that are coming in are going to start interacting before they get to the lesion in a more significant way. Where this gets really interesting is if we treat a patient and then three months or six months later we have another lesion somewhere else in the liver and the consensus is that we should use radiation to treat that. Trying to go back and recreate a meaningful dose volume histogram with those two lesions at different times is very difficult because the liver changes. You know, it'll get bigger and smaller with time. It's also sort of like jello. The shape of it can change considerably. So this is just mentioning the, the treatment approach that we've taken here and that we were doing follow-up imaging initially with about our first 30 patients, we treated at one month, or imaged at one month, and then every three months after that. We've dropped the one month imaging now because basically we don't see change at that point. It simply is too early. And I apologize because the results that I'm showing you are very tentative and they're very old. These are from the end of 2009. And the reason I'm doing that is because we're now several years later, updating the series for publication, and that process is not complete. So just to give you a sense of what the tentative results were, when we had a median time following SBRT of 171 days, we had six of six patients we had treated on the transplant list had actually received a transplant, 
and 29 of the 30 patients at that time had local control. The one that didn't have local control by imaging was one of the ones that got a transplant. So basically we're having very good results with this and we're still seeing local controls that are better than 90% with the SBRT. And we have yet to lose a patient from the transplant list. This is an example of a patient with a lesion here that was treated. You can see there's not too much change in the characteristics. I think this is nine months out, if I remember correctly. But here's what I consider really exciting about this. When you treat liver transplant patients, when the patient gets the new liver, the surgeon hands you the old liver, and you have to go and look and, and see what you did. We had done in Cleveland, we did something like this, treating 35 kilogram pigs so that we could see what we were doing. So here's the, the human analogy of that a decade later, where you can see this sort of necrotic jelly in the area we treated with no viable tumor. One, one thing that I will mention about the, when you look at transplant series where people are talking about examining the liver later, they'll often talk about a pretty high rate of finding viable tumor cells. But you need to look carefully, and it isn't always reported well in those series, at when they had their transplant relative to the SBRT. Because we know from treating in other parts of the body, it takes time for radiation to kill tumor cells. And if you look too soon, you're gonna find live cells, but we don't know what the significance of that is. So if you're transplanting patients a year out and you're still finding viable tumor, that probably has meaning. If you're transplanting patients three months out, you probably expect to find that. In this patient, they actually had two lesions, and so we've got the necrotic lesion, which is what you expect to see for a larger lesion. We had treated a smaller lesion, and it couldn't be identified at this time. And I'm just gonna mention that there are a lot of people that, that work on these treatments, our, our medical physicists and our dosimetrists. And at this point, I'll stop and see if there are any questions that people have. And while you're thinking about whether you have a question, I'll also mention that this is not a random picture, but San Antonio is the shotgun capital of the world. So the, the sporting clays and the skeet shooting, national and world championships are held here every October. So, anyway, do people have questions?